in totaling seven misdemeanors, some of which being disturbing a meeting. All of them, every single one of them, will walk away with this. Nothing, nothing. That's the plea deals that were given. That is, every single one of them was given a misdemeanor offer under advisement, which means after 12 months or after six months, they will walk away with absolutely nothing on their record. That means if you sit here and you have a parking ticket that's more on your record because they won't even walk away with a civil infraction. Now, in all my years of doing this, we have, I have never seen anything like that. And I know that's the, I've said that before. And so, that causes questions. Was this a real investigation? No. Or was it something for sure? So, again, when you hear and you read about the propaganda, as, as Fadwa has said, there's not one person after the case is over is going to have anything on their record. Right. That's terrible. Wow. This is unreal. Three years. And the other, the other something, this is, this, this is something that made us mad. We've told you about the additional information that we have found. We've told you that we still have to look, we have to spend a lot of time parsing through those millions of documents. We may find something in those documents that implicates some of these people. Wow. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's called double jeopardy. Wow. 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 So the law says, once they've been charged, once the, the case is over, we can't go back and charge anything emanating on the same certain, certain, a certain same set of facts. So. And that's because that was included in their plea offers wow. as well. Cool. So again, if we find after we review all these documents, after we do all the phone dumps on these, doc on these devices, that there is important evidence and critical evidence pointing to one of them, there's not a thing we can do based on the way the plea deals were constructed. Who constructed the plea deals? And basically, we're gonna get, I can't wait to hear from you. <laughs> basically, these plea deals literally said, in simple language, that once you pleaded this, even if we were to find anything else that had to do with Flint water, we can't bring charge on those, on those seven. Now that leads us to the third um, concern that I had about when I was first asked to join this team. And I wanted to know why there had only been charges as it relates to two deaths. Yeah. I'm a criminal prosecutor. I've been doing murder cases for decades. I was on the bench in the Wayne County Circuit Court presiding over murder cases for decades. I lead an office that unfortunately does a lot of murder cases. So I wanted to know why those investigations had not been pursued. And so that's why I said earlier that we believe there's no pre preconceived notion. All we're going to do is act on the facts and evidence that we have. Wherever it leads, it leads. Whoever it leads to, it leads to. But again, we can't touch these stuff. I want to touch on Prosecutor Worthy's point as well about the deaths. We know that there are many deaths out there that have yet to be investigated. Yeah. And it is, it is our obligation when we accepted this position, when we take an oath to represent the people of the state of Michigan, to investigate those deaths. Those families deserve it. Even if nothing was to turn out from it, if this were to happen somewhere else, these deaths would have been investigated to the fullest. To the fullest. I think that's the, um, that's the last slide that we have in terms of the, is there, you want to talk about what's next? Yep, the next one. So what comes next? We have alluded to it many times before. We have to go through all the evidence that we found. 
And I feel like I'm being repetitive. We have to go through all of the phone dumps. We have to flashback each and every one of those documents. And we have to continue the investigation. There is a lot of work to be done. And we could not, in good conscience, continue on the cases where there have been no guilty pleas, even the cases that have been in progress. We could not continue when we do have everything we have. It would be ethically improper. We'd be risking our licenses if we had evidence and we did not follow through. So we have an incredible amount of work to do. There's an incredible amount of investigation that has to be had. And these lawyers have been working nonstop to make sure this is being done. So even the, as Bob was said earlier, even the little bit of evidence we've had a chance to look at after the search warrants were done have given us pause. And we know that we made the right decision to terminate the cases without prejudice. And what without prejudice means, it means we can bring it back at any time. And it means no one is off the hook. It means that no one that we have something to do with is off the hook. Those seven was was prior to this team. Yes, absolutely. So those seven, but the cases that we dismissed, no one is off the hook. In fact, we have a lot of evidence to go through. If those cases would have went to trial prior to us going through the evidence, then we would have ran into double jeopardy issues. And also we need, we need to make clear too, and I think we've already said it, but it bears repeating again. We are ministers of justice, and so the cases that were dismissed without prejudice, it may be that we can find no evidence on some of those people. It may be we find more evidence on some of those people. We just don't know because we have to go through the evidence that we have and I'm sure more evidence we may potentially get. And quite frankly, we have a team of career prosecutors, hardworking individuals, investigators, and we just don't trust what's been given to us anymore. And we will not take anyone's word for this. We uh, made the decision to pursue all the evidence if at any point in time something comes to our attention that we need to execute another search warrant, be where it may, we will. And right now, even though those cases are dismissed, um, we have a very, very, very important task ahead of us. Because we're also running on a statute of limitations. And that is very important is that we have to make sure that we use this time. We are at 20 million documents. Remember, Prosecutor Worthy said that each document could be a thousand pages, a hundred pages, or ten pages. Documents are different than pages. We are at 20 million documents. When we came in for three years, they were dealing with 1.5 million pages. So we have a lot of work to do in a short amount of time, this is this is not going on forever. The statute of limitations runs out in nine months. And we need the help. So that is why, that is why, and we are not saying this to be to inflame anybody. Again, we're not saying this to talk about anybody. We're telling you that this is what the law tells us. Most crimes have statute of limitations. That is why it's so important from the very beginning to make sure before you start charging folks that you have a proper investigation. So you're not your back is not against the wall when it comes to the statute of limitation. But we're gonna get it done. We need help. This is, this is honestly um, going to require every single one of you and every single one of us. Uh, and we're willing to do it. And quite frankly, the city and the people of Flint deserve it. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have a short amount of time. They've wasted three years for zero, for nothing. And I see some of you guys with, with binders, with notebooks, 
what we have created as well is aligned directly to the team that do we have our number on the screen? So if you have a pen, if you have your phones, um, or you can take a picture, or this is directly on our website at the Attorney General's office as well. If you have something you need to email us, email it to our email address ag ag-flintwater-tip at michigan.gov and then the phone number 1-833-643-5869 um, we is it 68? oh I'm sorry 5468 And there are some cards with this information at the front table as well. We look at this as every citizen in Flint is a victim of this case. And will continue to be for a very long time because of what happened. I think that I would encourage you to keep a direct line of communication with this information and our investigators are monitoring the emails. We've already received some information that we've looked at. And our team, uh, this incredible team, whether it's the investigators or the people behind me, uh, I have personally seen them get emotional. Some of you have sat down with us and cried. Um, and quite frankly, this is because this is a human case and a case of true injustice. But I assure you that you have a team working day in and day out to make sure that anyone responsible or we can prove criminally responsible had anything to do criminally with the Flint water crisis that could be proven in court. That could be proven in court. No matter where they are on this earth, we will charge them. So, I just want to make sure. Again, we will take the evidence where it leads us. We will charge when we can. And sometimes we won't be able to charge because we won't be able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But what I can say, this team is fearless. They are hardworking. They are dedicated. And they aren't afraid of anyone. So they are all boots on the ground working on this day by day. And they're very, very committed to you and to this case. Now, I, we won't be able to answer any questions about what's contained in any of these documents, about what's on this phone. We can't talk about the investigation. We've talked about the process with you. What we've tried to explain is why we had to do what we did. But we won't be able to have, answer any questions about the sum and substance of what's contained and how we are going in that part of the investigation. But we will get it done. We will make the right and just decision at the end of our investigation. Thank you. Let's give them a hand for being here tonight. So again, we're going to start to take questions. Some of you filled out cards in the back. Um, we are going to start with 1A, Arthur Woodson. Remember, you have two minutes. Right here. Thank you, sir. First question is, uh, from what I heard, uh, and I was at every trial, except for one, except for one, and what I saw at the trial, Dr. Laura Sullivan stand, it sounded like things was going right. And what I see here today really pisses me off. I saw it every day. Uh, I thought I was one of the lawyers. 
I really trusted Todd Flood. He came down here, I advocated for Todd Flood. I heard the plea deal with Leanne Shepard Smith that she would not be charged with anything else is found. Just to think that they got less time poisoning over 98,000 people than somebody still a slice of pizza. People would have died. My cousin would have died. My aunt died. My friend would have died. And to know that Todd Flood, who I advocated for, when people were saying things, has really truly upset, upset me and have me at the point to where, where I have PTSD. And you know, it's hard to trust. But what I heard here today, being totally honest, have me feeling that you all are working for the people because you have done something that no one else has done. You came here along with the press and told us at the same time with the press what is going on. That means a lot to me and it makes me feel like I am part of the recovery. So my question to you, and from what I heard, is there Cover up of the cover. Right. Yeah. All I can really say to answer that question, and thank you for your heart, is whatever we find, we're going to let the facts and evidence lead us. So we can't make any pronouncements about who was responsible for what, because of all the other evidence that's out here, because we don't know what we have yet fully. And so what we can say to you fully and completely is we are going to let the facts and evidence be our guide as to what we, we charge and we don't. To a brave hall. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for what you have. I knew it all the time. I ran from here to see the Clint based on the fact that we should be mad and done this because it was all a, a hoax and a joke to me. But we all in our own lane doing our own thing. My thing is that we need, if you would help us, you can we understand. But we need to file charges against Bill Shooter. We need to file charges against Todd Flood. And that money, whatever it is, can go back to you all and what you're trying to do and back to this community. The second thing is that I'm asking, if you can help us in any way, please, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll be, my name is Ray Hawes, so you get an idea of who it is trying to contact you. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, Ask everybody is that it's getting to a point with this right here that it's time to go before the United Nations. This is very, like she said, this is a crime of humanity. Yes, we sir. Yes, about sir. Humanity in our water, but we're not doing anything about it. We have the opportunity right now to create our own United Nations chapter right here in the city of Flint. And I can't get one of y'all to stand up and do nothing. So, hey, look, don't get mad at me because I try to stay in my own way because you can do things by yourself, like people pressing charges against the EPA or whatever. So, like, again, we have to ask. If we came together with the people, we could be mad. But we, like, again, I'm going to go. <laughs> but, like, all I'm asking is, is an opportunity for y'all to, to represent us in some kind of way to get back at them. If they can't, charges can't be filed because you found incompetence on their behalf. They betrayed us. They lied. It's been three years of what they did. So if you can't do the job for you, let us know what kind of lawyers we can get to get it done. Because they can be sued and prosecuted. You just said. I believe it's Syrah or Sarah Scott. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your honesty. You know, so many questions, uh, but what I'd like to ask is, um, you know, I come in and out of the community to help, and I want to ask, first off, how, where does, how, where, how is this case being, like, how far does it span? Is it starting from uh, when they made the switch, uh, what they use to, you know, treat the water? Uh, to how it's going to affect kids in the future, how it's affecting kids and children now. 
Uh, what sort of information do you need from the people in Flint? How do you uh, suggest we mobilize people to get information to you since it's such a short amount of time to get all this information and, and actually charge people? Thank you for your question. The best I can say for you right now is if you have information for us, contact us via this number and we'll certainly give you the material that you have if you have any other. But again, we can't tell you where this is going to lead. We can't tell you where it's going to go. Just like in any criminal investigation that we do on any case. We have to let the documents that we have, the physical evidence we have, the witness testimony, whatever we have collected as a part of this investigation tell us where we, where we need to go. And we will follow each and every lead where it takes us. That's what an investigation does. And so we're going to be complete and we're going to be thorough. I know we've got to move with a pace a little, a little bit quicker than we, than we should have to, but we're going to get it done. And that's the one. I, I, I hate to keep on saying that. I know it's frustrating. But we have to let the evidence that we have lead us. And that'll tell us who we can charge and where we can go. That's the best answer I can give you. I'm sorry. Bob Mavitt. And followed by Mel. Thank you for being here. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to ask when I came here today, and the information gave us so much more I can take to ask. Um, one thing I'm sure people do want to know is truly what what kind of ramifications could come um, to flood or others involved in mishandling of this case thus far. Losing your license to carbon, is that a realm of possibility? We're, we're just here on, on the criminal investigation. Um, that's what our scope and what our jurisdiction is. Sure. And so that's what we're speaking to. And based on everything that we told you, that we're another, gonna make the, the Another question that I, or thing that maybe I thought I thought to ask about was, um, you know, we've certainly heard about Lee Janelle and Lead. Um, we haven't ever heard very much about other ailments uh, related to lead and copper that adults may suffer. I was diagnosed with kidney failure. Are there the same kinds of cluster studies that Dr. Mona did to show the lead that we, uh, public human services may have done? Would your evidence show suppression of an effort to have that kind of research? We don't know. We have to, we that have would to be, be the kind of thing we could look at. Though. We'll look at all of that. Wherever, I'm not sound like a broken record, but wherever the evidence is, we will follow. We will follow. Uh, each time I hear somebody argue about how many millions we've spent on this investigation so far, the way that it, it sounds in my ears is like, like Flint's not worth that investment, and uh, lack of investment is how we ended up in this crisis in the first place. And so my question is, how much is the state willing to spend? Is there a price point that our lives are worth? And when do we um, bring in the financial decisions uh, to regulate this investigation? That's a great question in terms of the investment uh, in the investigation itself. We do not control how much money is put into this investigation. That's something that comes uh, from the state itself and the governor's office and the legislature. Um, so it is very important, one, that they fund this. They funded it for three years. Uh, what we have to make sure are those funds are being used to conduct a thorough investigation and that nobody is benefiting off of those funds but the people of Flint and this investigation. Um, but in terms of the actual funding itself, that is not in our realm. I, I have a quick question to follow up on that. Um, it's apparent by what you've shown that the money how much was spent in that three years with no real convictions? Do we know the amount? I know Ron Founders here, and he just did an article on that, and I believe we are over 30 million. So, 30 million dollars in three years. Can any of that money be recouped? 
Yeah. But is there is there any way for that money to be recouped and put toward an actual investigation, which seems to have started when Dana Nessel appointed you? Snyder. That is outside of what we did with them, of what we can do, but that money has been spent. Jim Burroughs. On what? We need detailed invoices. Speak to the mic, sir. Please speak a little closer into the mic. Hello. Thank you. We spoke about the statute of limitations. What's the end date, the beginning date of the statute for this uh, particular incident? And also, what happens to people that are granted opportunity for prosecution uh, to testify against the employees? So I'm told that the statute of limitations is six years on this conduct and ten years on the manslaughter. From the date of the crime, not from this date, from the date of the crime. It's, it will vary through each incident. It depends. But you indicated that it's nine months. Nine months left for, for the misconduct. So what are the charges that are being possible? We, it'd be hard to answer that question because we have to review all the documentation. So if there are a multitude of charges that it could be, we just don't know. And I don't want to give you some information if we find out we have evidence on some other charges that we didn't know anything about. What about the person that we're I'm sorry, can you speak? What about the person that we're bringing with you in the prosecution? What happens to their case? The seven people that were, that whose cases are going to be dismissed? So if there were some people that were bringing with you to testify against what happened? He said there were people who were granted immunity to testify what will happen to them. Those were the plea deals? The plea deals? Like we showed, they walk away with nothing. They didn't work. We are not aware of different immunity. Yeah, we have to, one of the things that's puzzling to us is we hear a lot of chatter about who was granted immunity wasn't, but there are certain legal procedures that have to be followed for that immunity to actually be granted, and we don't have any documented evidence so far that the statute was followed. So, in other words, uh, the people that are granted immunity, uh, that's the data that at this point? We, don't, we just don't know yet, so we have to look at what we have. There, what's supposed to happen when you grant someone immunity is just supposed to be what's called a proffer that's made. That, yeah, people with plead guilty. They have to be in writing. And we have, we have it has, it's supposed to set out exactly what that person's going to testify to before, like, uh, let me give my, in my office, if one of my postures comes to me and says, I need testimony from this particular person, I don't want to speak specifically on this investigation. So if, one, if someone comes to me and says, I want this person to be granted immunity because they're going to help our case and they're going to testify and give us all the information that they have, without which we will not have a successful prosecution on the person that we really want to be able to prosecute. We sit down with them, their lawyer. We take, we know what they're gonna say. It's committed to a written document that all parties sign. It's filed with the judge. And then we know what that person's gonna say. And if they don't make out what they say they're gonna do with this written document, if they don't cooperate or they don't show up in court, then we can bring the charges. We can possibly bring charges against them that we normally maybe, maybe not would have done. So it depends. We are, not aware at this point in time of any written proffers that were done in this case. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Lavonzella Jones. Hi, how are you? My question is, the AG shooting said that Snyder could not be charged after he retired. Did he get immunity? Or are you guys have him on your list as one of the people that you're looking at? Regardless, I'm not saying you gotta answer that question. I'm not saying that. But if he ain't on the list, you guys might as well go home. And again, we will take the evidence exactly where it takes us.
Claudia Milton. Claudia Perkins Milton. Uh -oh. <laughs> She's been waiting. Well, I, actually, I think that uh, you are pretty intelligent people. And uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about this redacted thing you were talking about. I saw all those things blotted out. But is there any way you can get information off of there? Uh, say they erase their information that was pertinent to the case. Can you recover that in any kind of way? Millions of dollars. If something was deleted, you mean? Yeah. For instance. Because well, it's well, obvious that they hid some pertinent information. That's the first thing on my mind. So all of those documents that you saw redacted, when we executed our search warrants, we took all of those documents, their entire hard drive, original data with nothing unredacted. And that's the way, and the judge found probable cause to sign a search warrant on that basis. Uh -huh. So we, we know they hid a lot of stuff. We already know that. And we're a pretty smart bunch too. And let me tell you about us. You see all these shirts? Yes. We're the Democracy Defense League, so we've been on boots on the ground from day one. <laughs> We have gone from the White House to the outhouse, trust me. And we have marched and fought, and we're not the only ones that got, got poisoned in the state, in the United States. But we know that the focal point is on us. Now it's a lot of criminality just off the top of your head in this thing, in this thing. This young man right here, this turn around, baby, turn around for you. This my little cousin. Since here was on the cover of Time Magazine, that's my cousin. My nephew was on CNN, he was the highest dead count in Genesee County. I broke out, my sister died. We've had a lot of criminality every which way you can count. So a lot of us are really angry. And we want to see some justice. We want justice. This thing has gotten so nasty because the half the Legionella uh, cases weren't even talked about. Right. And we want justice. I want justice. I believe y'all are the ones to do it. Don't make me out of a liar. Mm -mm. All right. And this, this, this situation right here, I heard you say, what's your name? Oh, five, five minutes. Yes. I heard you say the word, and this is key, <laughs> disaster. We should have been classified a disaster. And then we would have gotten the relief that we deserve. Because five years is a long time to be going through this. We got cases of water in our households. You know, we got to wash dishes after we boil the water that's bottled up. Another thing, somebody should investigate Snyder and his wife, because she was sitting on one of the boards. And they should investigate them because they're giving us spring water. And we heard Dr. Reynolds speak up here on that very stage you're sitting on, and that spring water has got some, some stuff in it, and, and it's not good for drinking. So we're drinking purified water, a lot of us, even if we have to buy it. There's a lot of criminality going on around here, and we want all of it investigated. We're spending money like crazy, and we're not getting any justice. We have the highest water rate in the United States of America. And we, and we have the largest fresh body of water in the world. We do. But then you got this low down Nestle coming in here spending $200 using 450,000 gallons per minute of our water, rebottling it and acting like they the savior of Flint and they're not. Rebottling it and giving it back to us and spending it, sending it all over the world, making it rich and not leaving anything in our community. So that's what I really want to say. There's a lot of criminals in this case. It's wide open. So all we want, we want justice. We want to obliterate that emergency manager law because they're in here and we, the people, own a lot of stuff. But privatization, with the emergency yes. manager step in and misuse this whole city. Yes. See, a lot of people don't understand that language, but I do because I'm a union rep at the highest level. So I'm just telling you, we're watching. We're watching all of them. 
And wherever we can help, we will help. But we want to be clear that we want to be notified. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm with that group there. Um, and we have been around even before the, the water crisis um, investigating the financial emergency manager and other things that led up to this point. Um, and we've come together as a group um, with a list of questions that we're trying to get to to ask. And I've been tasked with the, with the top one, at least I'm the first one to come and, come and ask this. Um, it has two components to it. And it's a little less uh, I guess, important than what Claudia was talking about, but sure is. Um, I'm really glad to see, and we're grateful to hear your explanation for the charges. We're not, I mean, as as you know, we're not stupid. We we figured out probably what your what your tactics were and kind of why you were doing what you were doing to dismiss the charges without prejudice. We understood that and exculpatory evidence and some other stuff too. Um, I'm glad to see that there's a uh, uh, an email and a and a phone line. But the question is, do you not realize how it felt when you released to the press? Not dropping the charges Not without all. coming here first, Lord. without any kind of communication. And we, and we understand your legal position. We do, we're not stupid. But you could have at least, the very least have said, we're going to be doing something, we can't talk about it. Right. You know, just any kind of acknowledgement that we exist before going to the press and then waiting 15 days to have this meeting. Why was there that span of time with radio silence? It just kills us. It, it really hurt. It really, you really did a lot to destroy a lot of trust. And you need us on our side, on your side. We need you on our side. We need to be together as a team. You've got to do something to repair that trust of making that announcement without having the communication. You've got to understand the PTSD that we have from not being in communication when people are making decisions, especially the important ones for this. Uh, the second, okay, if, if, with your permission, please. Um, the second component to that, in terms of breaking our trust or, or jeopardizing some of that trust that we need to move, that you need to address to answer to all of us so that we can move forward. And um, prosecutor worthy, I, I hope you'll you'll forgive some of the bluntness of my remarks um, because I think they're addressed a little bit directly to you. There are a lot of people in this community that do not trust you, that have very big issues with you as a prosecutor and uh, personally, myself, I, 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 I feel so, I have to just say, I'm so upset with your role uh, in Suwatu, um, Salama Ra's case, shackling a pregnant woman, uh, having to give birth, incarcerated, uh, shackled like a, you know, a, it, I, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. I promised people that I would look you in the eye and bring that case up because it's it's inconscionable. I know that that it's not just you, you're on a team, but your role in it is, I don't think I'm ever gonna get over that. It's gonna destroy my trust. No, that's me personally. Now, for the community in general, that combined with other things, the question is, why were you picked out of all the attorneys in the United States, in the world? I mean, this is, and it's not just me asking this question, so I, please forgive me um, I, for being direct and blunt. Uh, but that is the question, and, and, and we would really like an answer to that because we're really struggling with those things. Thank you. I'll answer the other question first. And I know the case you're talking about, and I don't know if people realize that that was a jury trial. It wasn't a judge trial. Um, we made charges issues based on the evidence that we have. 
And it was us, after we found out the medical condition, that contacted the defense lawyer. And together we came up with a resolution, or a stipulation, an agreement, to go to the judge and ask if she can be released. Because we had documentation of any kind of medical issues. And that was turned down by the judge. So we did anything, everything that we could to work with the defense attorney, and I think the defense attorney would back us up as well, to make sure that, and as you know, she later did get out and had to return because that was, she was convicted by a jury of the charges and she was sentenced by a judge. And we did everything we can to work with the defense attorney during that process to make sure she was out for a period of time and she, she was medically ready to come back and serve a sentence. So we certainly issued the charges. We certainly took that case to trial. We think that the charges were valid. We presented the information to a jury, and it was a phone assault. We presented that information to a jury, and they made that decision. When we found out, as I said, about the medical condition of the defendant, we did everything we could to try and get her out until she had a child. So you may not agree with me, and that's fine. That's fine. The reason we think we disagree. But we know the evidence that we had. I don't know if you followed the trial at all. Um, so there is a transcript of the trial if you're interested in that as well. And if you disagree with us on that case, and, and I, I, we follow the law. And again, we took the extraordinary measure of contacting the defense ourselves and trying to make that make a solution that the judge couldn't accept. So that's that case. I'm not sure what the other reasons are, but why was I picked? I, I think I was picked because it's been shown through the career that we are not afraid of tough cases that we will charge police officers or public officials or anyone as long as the evidence takes us there and that we wouldn't shy away from anything that came along in this case. So I think that's why. As far as this, we can, we can don't ever, I have no problem with anyone sharing their feeling with me. I have no problem with anyone disagreeing with me. I respect the fact that you asked me that question. Uh, I will respect your opinion and sometimes reasonable people can just disagree. So, unfortunately, when you have the job that I have, and when you do almost 20,000 felony cases a year, and misdemeanors and juveniles, there's gonna be a case or two or three or four that you may not agree with. But I can tell you, I can tell you, when we make our decisions, we make it with the evidence we have at the time, we try to be moral, just, honest, and fair, and sometimes people are gonna disagree. So, that's the best that we can do, but we will never back away from charging someone that we think should be charged who did something wrong that we can prove in court. As far as the other part of your question about why we came and dismissed the case without coming to you first, we'll explain the legal procedure of that. In terms, and I also want to, I think, even though our Attorney General is not here, you know it was our Attorney General that asked Prosecutor Worthy to come on this case. Our Attorney General has said before that one not only was Prosecutor Worthy a mentor of hers, she worked under her, she learned under her wings, but I, I want, and, and so did I, but I want to say this, specifically in this case, um, that I've seen Prosecutor Worthy work on this case, uh, call me even about this case, sometimes as late as 11 p.m. or as early as 4.30 a.m., and I'm thinking, why is she up? Her heart is for justice. And Prosecutor Worthy, when you say out of all the people, Prosecutor Worthy is a public servant. She is someone that the people have elected over and over again. She does not have a private firm. She is not getting one penny extra from what she already makes to step in and help. And that is because it is the right thing to do. Her experience, her knowledge of the law has been essential to getting us where we are today. And in fact, um, first and foremost, I think on behalf of all of us, we do apologize for not having been able to do that sooner. And you have every right to feel that way because like we said, every, we believe every person in the city of Flint is a victim. And I appreciate your honesty because one, that's what we need to hear. We can do better, but I think you also deserve to hear our reason. But before you hear our reasoning, because I want to make sure that you don't think it's an excuse, is that we have still a lot to grow, just even 
in terms of uh, understanding what every single one of you have been through and we'll never get there. And I don't think you know anyone from outside of the people that have lived here would ever get that. So we appreciate you telling us that because that is something we must take into consideration. This is, uh, when we released the press release, that was the day, and where's Keisha? Keisha is right here. And like we told you, this was a big secret. And for strategical reasons as well with our cases, even where some of our cases stood in court, uh, and just so we don't have legal implications, because that week was a very important week on one of the defendants as well, and we were waiting for the complete transfer of evidence. Um, the first thing that we did, uh, and this was a situation where literally, we have a, we have a room over at the, uh, the Attorney General's office. We call it the war room, because we really do feel like we're going to war sometimes, all the time. But the first thing that we did, uh, and this was prosecutor worthy actually. She said, we are not having any press conferences. We will not take not one question from the press. We will write as detailed of a statement as we can to announce as soon, at the same time that we are filing the dismissals, we are sending our letter to the people. And that letter is the one that announced that we are going, we're not taking any uh, questions from the press and that we're going to have uh, a community conversation with the people, and then the date that came along. And there are some things that we took into fact, some things that we took into consideration. One is to make sure that this was for the city, to give people notification. And quite frankly, we are going to hopefully continue to do that when needed and do even better than what we did. So. I hope that answers your question, and I appreciate your honesty. This, the 15 days, I think you were asking why it took so long. We wanted to do it at a time where we thought people were, were off work. We wanted to do it at a time where at 6 o'clock so we, we wouldn't be, we could get the most people we can out. It was simply a scheduling issue, and we could all be here to face you, and that, that's what it was. Unfortunately, it took 15 days. We, we that was the soonest day that we could, that we could get for all of us to be here. So we do apologize for that, but we did the best we could in terms of timing. We were up against a legal deadline, as Bob mentioned. We had a judge that was getting ready to give some opinion. And that's we had a judge that was getting ready to give an opinion who didn't have, wasn't privy to all this information that we were sharing with you. And we didn't want to be legally bound by that because we had all this additional evidence we had to go through. So that's why we had to do it that way. And again, we have to be a very, very strategic when it comes to certain legal things we have to do. So it may not be palatable, it may not have been the best way we want to handle it, but we have to do that for the sake of the case. Thank you so much, and thank you for your, your questions. I, I'm probably going to get a talking to later, but I have watched Prosecutor Worthy since I was five years old. Um, she will go after anyone, and when it was a nut, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when it was announced that she was on this team, I actually felt relieved. You have to understand, I'm not just up here as a moderator, I'm on medication every day like many of you. So, you, 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 have, you have an issue, sir, you can step out. Okay, so I just wanted to let you all know that we have a team here that, that's according to the evidence, doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and I appreciate it. Smarter. Vicki Marks? I just wanted to say, we have probably 35 or more people that still want to talk to the community, and it's, you know, we, we really need our time to ask so, more questions. Vicki Marks? I'm, a, I'm also here with the Democracy, Democracy Defense League, and one of the questions we came up with is we were wondering if the Attorney General's office is going to pursue an investigation and charges into the illegal bond issuance for the KWA. Yes. Which is part of the reason why our water rates are so high. Even looked 
again, we are going to wherever they, we have we have a lot of documents to go through, and I can't I can't, I can't sit here and tell you how many of those documents have to do with that particular aspect. I don't know, but what, if there's a, prosecut a prosecutable case in this investigation, we will charge it. You might want to pay special attention to Jeff Wright and yes. Andy Dillon. Yeah. We will, and we're going to say this over and over again. We will follow the evidence that we have. And we will charge based on the law. It doesn't matter who it is or who it isn't. Thank you. Jolita Freeman. Jolita Freeman. Hi, everybody. My name is Jolina Freeman. Um, I'm also with Democracy Defense. And um, my question today is, will Attorney General pursue an investigation in the charges of Viola? Um, he said back in 2015 that the water was safe to drink. Well, we all know that it still isn't. I think that that goes, again, to we are investigating the Flint water crisis as a whole. We're going to go where our investigation leads us in that time that we have. And we still have, we're not going to give you what you want to hear. Because quite frankly, you've been told a lot of things. What we can tell you is what we've committed to, is that we're gonna go through the evidence, and after going through the evidence, doing a thorough investigation, doing our job, doing what should have been done day one of this investigation, those who are criminally, who we can prove, are criminally responsible for what happened, Flint water crisis, will be charged. Mar, Mar Joyce, I'm sorry, not say that wrong, Campbell, Mary Joyce Campbell, followed by R.L. Mitchell. Hello. Hello. You know what? <clears throat> I have a heavy heart right now. Heavy. It hurts. After I heard what you all have said to us, I cannot believe something like this can happen. You can't even believe it. But it did. It happened. And now you're going to tell us you're going to fix it? They couldn't fix it back then. It only started with not putting corrosion control in the water from the emergency manager and from Mr. Snyder. That's where it goes back to. OK? I can't help it. I'm hurting. I don't have no aches. I don't have no pain. I came here to listen, and I just feel so sad that you got all this new stuff at you that was back in the day that you couldn't get. How did this happen? And it's scary. How does this happen, everybody? How does it happen? I don't know how it happened. going to roll, that somebody is going to pay for all this murder, all this criminal activity. My heart is hurting. I'm sorry. It hurts. I cannot believe stuff in a basement. I can't believe stuff was redacted and you had to go and find, find, find it. Please tell me how can this happen? in 2019. Miss Mary Joyce, I want to tell you something. That 
One, just, and this was a concern, is how this would affect people listening to it because it had affected us. But I want to tell you something else. Is that justice is not part of justice, is that this city, at least, at the very least, deserves a full investigation, not a partial investigation. And we are now in the best position possible. The best position possible because we now have the most comprehensive body of evidence that we've never had. And that's hope. And that's justice that maybe at one point was not given or was not attainable, but we have it now. And that to me, we cannot go back in time. But all we can do is keep doing what we're doing and keep going on this track and hopefully uh, keep honoring the oath that we took to serve the city. And we'll do everything we can to have your back. R.L. Mitchell, please. Is there R.L. Mitchell? I can't hear you, so you got to speak to the mic. I'm R.L. Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a victim of the circumstances. Oh, uh, like. That's when I first come up into the door. I didn't know I was going to speak until until they gave me this number thirteen. That's okay. oh. I used to work across the street, and I and I got married on June thirteenth. They said, "What's the matter with you, fellow? Don't you know you're supposed to get married, don't you?" They made fun of me across the street at Chevrolet Truck Center. They threatened. I worked in the bank department. Okay, I'm going to say this. I say that. I say this. I've been. Homeless for 40 years, I added that up. All depends on this. I'm dealing with this house of Esther now, worse than this water situation. It was down in the city hall three minutes ago, then when they jumped on my councilman, just like you, the first word you say, Jamie, you said, everybody can speak except politicians, but I become a, a, a sociologist. What's the difference between a sociologist and a politician, lady? Tell me that. Politicians are elected. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the difference of a, uh, a You have a question about the complaint criminal cases, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'm actually, okay, if it's too many of then I'm going to talk to them. Because you have to rush in the time like they do in City Hall. Two minutes and no feedback. Uh, the lady said that she wants to start with this criminal investigation. She can start. Right across the street, right there. I almost got ran over with friends and not the bus coming through here. But they found out the water was busted and they threw rocks on the truck and they, they changed that water right away. And what them they can't do nothing right away like, like you people come to fit to do something right away, lady. The lady put the microphone right there. And the dude in the third world country with general well, treating us like third world people citizens like in the Middle East. And he back there ain't saying nothing. Like that earth. Big Dr. put him in charge. He ain't even sitting here. Put the governor. Big, big eyeballs, southern eyeballs. I mean, but okay, anyway, sir, come on to the office. Uh, start. Watch if they got that water so they drink it. They can use the clean water and we still using that. Okay, yeah, sir, thank you. Stop right there, baby. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Thank you. Or Lisa Fowler, please. Followed by, I believe it's Leela McBee Harvey. Or Layla McBee Harvey. Hello. Um, my name is for Lisa Fowler. Sorry. Okay. My name is for Lisa Fowler. I'm um, a resident and this is my daughter. Um, we've been involved with water crisis since the beginning. It's been Basically, um, including the elected officials that are not allowed to talk. Some of them marched with us, too, and we value their opinions. 
doesn't spell. So you should ask us before you make, impose those kind of rules to you. Exactly. You need to have a respect for it. We feel disrespected by your team in some aspects. We have a hard time trusting, like Art said. We need you to ask us before you make those rules. You need to come to us if you want that trust. And I don't see it yet. Okay? Second of all, we have been hurt. And we recognize that. And I recognize everybody in here from Flint. In my speech right now, I want them to know that they matter. Their heart matters, their opinion matters, their lives matter. Okay. Second of all, I was involved with the first investigation as well. And I was interviewed. And I want to know why you still have, if you're, they're so bad, why you still have one of their top investigators on your team? Jeff Splinko? Can you answer me that? Next, I don't think you have the capacity that we, for justice that we need, and that's to go after Snyder. Rick Snyder, that's who we want. And unless you give it, you need to give this investigation up and give it to the feds. So they can go get it before our statute limitations run up. Yes. There were a couple of things, a couple of questions I think compiled. In one, um, I think it goes to having a team that is dedicated. I think that we have at least shown you we're not here to tell you. Um, and we will continue to show you that we're not here to just give you words. So thank you for your comment. Good evening, everybody. You have to speak to the microphone. That's what I get for being a six-foot friend. Um, thank you. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming in. I do, from the bottom of my heart. Some of us have been on the ground, and then some of us took the time to do thorough research. And so I want to say to our community, certainly we have been hurting, but we should have beat Todd Flood this way too. I just want to say that. And as angry as we are without giving them an opportunity, I didn't see us marching when we found out what he did to us. For some of us, we understood when Donnell Early and Howard Cross was charged, instead of Mike Brown and Ed Kurtz, that they were going in the wrong direction. Some of us understood that. Some of us also understand that Governor Snyder didn't pull this off by himself. Some of us in our community don't like to speak about our local stakeholders because they're feeding us. If we're going to speak truth to power, let's talk about it. Regionalization in this pipeline started in 1968. People were already arrested. They brought it back in 2007. They gave it a name. And they went around and got four counties to join in 2010. That was before Governor Snyder was elected. This was a three-tier heist. The state and the county was balancing their books off of our community. So if we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it. But what I want our community to do is give this team an opportunity because you gave Flood one. For those of us who are complaining that they did not come in and ask us, neither did the concerned pastors. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to speak to the power. So I want to give this team, who was not satisfied with five phones, but when it got 612, I'm going to take trust with them. And our community needs to do that for this team. I thank you for coming in there, and anything that we can do, we are in support. Let's move forward. We have nine months to make right what Todd Flood did and Shooty did to our community. Thank you, guys. Thank you. April and Jeff Hawkins. April and Jeff.
Jeff Hawkins, followed by Claire McClinton. Good evening. Good evening. I first want to say thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time and really rolling with it. Thank you so much for getting 600 phones in the little time that you had, when they only had five for three years. I appreciate you because I know you're searching, I know you're getting the evidence, and I'm going to put my faith with you. Thank you. So my first question is, with the statute of limitation and how short it is, how will you get legislation to approve funding? Because we only have nine months, as you stated. Oh, and, and we all know with the 1% that they, were, that they gave you, and you came back and got 100%, those people that hid that information from you, Will you go after them? Thank you, April. So, I want to be very clear too as to the statute of limitations. It differs on the act, right? So, from some of the charges of misconduct, so misconduct is six years, we're assuming nine months. I don't want you to hold on to, to a number that is still under investigation. Because we might, we might end up finding evidence that something happened later or before, okay? So keep that in mind. We don't want to give you numbers and later on you question, but you said this. So that's an estimate for the misconduct. And for the manslaughter charges, if we can prove manslaughter charges, those are the 10 years. But the misconduct caused the manslaughter, and that's why it's important to us that we proceed on the shorter time. And we will do everything that we can strategically to make our case when we present it as strongest instead of piecemeal. So, but in terms of that, we will keep you updated as to those statute of limitations. I think your second question was as to the investing. You know, at the end of the day, so many people, um, whether it is what happened here or what happened in this investigation, or as someone else has alluded to, many other criminals walking around even for other things. We need to put Flint water at our focal point right now. And everybody else can have a seat. And this is what we're charged with right now. And so many people have gotten attention off of this case. Whether it is positive attention or negative attention. So many people are out, still using this case to go out on tours with the meeting. Yes. It's not about them anymore. Yes. The show is over. We got a lot of work to do. And we're doing it. Ms. Claire. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. This uh, news today is like being hit in the back of the head with a two by four. The press release about the charges, that was also like being hit in the back of the head with a two by four. Now, we are not gonna get into, because we're not capable of getting into or what Todd Floyd did, what you did, but we promise you this. You're sitting in a hall, the founding local of the great sit-down strike. Yeah. Right. We are a justice-minded community. We will not be ran over by anybody. And we are the ones that will decide when justice is done. We're not going to depend on you to tell us. 
We're not going to depend on Ty Flood because we know when justice is done and we'll decide that. Yeah. And I'm also with Democracy Defense League because let's telescope back and look at this. Promises was made. The Attorney General, with all due respect, and God knows we hope she bring victory. And you bring victory. We hope that, but we're not going to depend on that. We're going to take our own actions and monitorings in the situation. We still got Washington, D.C. investigating. We're going to throw out all the, the, the nets to bring the justice home. Now, a couple of things, the Attorney General, she let uh, Mr. Arena go, she let Mr. Hall go, she let Todd Flood go. None of this was communicated to us about, and we know, we're not saying we need to know all the if, ands, and buts about the case, but we spoke with Attorney General when she was running. We spoke with Attorney General during the lame duck session. We went to Lindsay and fought for her to have the power for you to even do what you're doing today. We stood with her to keep the legislature from stripping her of her power. Now, there were other promises made by the administration. Return to the pods. We don't have those. Where are the pods at? The Attorney General Office just last week went to the Supreme Court to get summary judgment to drop a case of a mother and her child against four MDEQ people. What about dropping those doggone charges? Why are you dropping these charges? So we can settle our cases. So what I'm saying is to say, we appreciate you we take you at your word, but at the same time, we are going to be holding you accountable. And unfortunately, you're going to get the wrath of this city that we probably should have did with Todd Flood. And you're going to have to pay the price for that because we will not give up. We will not back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. So I want to make something, those are very important questions. That first slide, the Attorney General in this case is not on the criminal cases. In terms of the firing of Andy Arena or anybody else on this case, the other name you mentioned as well, um, that was not a decision that the Attorney General herself, because she tasked us with leading this team. So that is not the Attorney General, okay? Yes, there were people that were terminated, and I specifically, Prosecutor Worthy is on, with me on this one, every single one of these people behind me was told, anybody that I believe has jeopardized the integrity of this case and was not pursuing justice in the best interest of Flint has no room on this team. And will continue to do so. Third, as to the case that you mentioned, that's a civil case. We can't talk about the civil cases because we don't know about them. There's that conflict 12. So we cannot answer anything as to the civil cases. Melissa Mays followed by Laura Sullivan. Hi. As you guys have made clear, there is the, the wall, and the AG announced today that neither Attorney Smoot or Worthy report to her, even though she chose to appoint both of you. And again, we're, we have to start from the beginning. We have a few basic questions. Um, first of all, Attorney Hamoud, um, how many major criminal cases have you personally taken through trial in one of those cases? Um, and Attorney Worthy, you guys were talking about um, the plea deals and how bad they were and everything. Um, have you ever made plea deals to get the convictions of more serious criminals? 
Um, also, on March 3rd, the AG stated that any settlement that comes from Noah Hall's case, which was the people of Flint versus Veolia and Lamb, that, that is a civil case, um, that she said that any settlement that comes from that case should go into the state's general fund to, off -state, uh, to offset the state's liability to the victims of Flint instead of going to the actual victims. That does not seem like justice to me, not an actual all. victimized Flint resident. So on the criminal side, do you actually know what justice looks like to the affected residents? Meaning our definition, not yours. Um, and before this week and the closed door meetings, how many times have you sat with Flint residents to find out what justice means to us, especially those who lost loved ones and who were blindsided by that announcement? And also, how is making the dismissal announcement in the way that you did any kind of a respectful, trustworthy action to us? And again, this everything should be about us, not what Todd Flood did, not what you're doing, exactly what Claire said. This is about us and our suffering our, that's ongoing. Day, what is day? What, eight, 1,890. Um, also, please don't underestimate us and our involvement and how we follow the cases. We want to hear about any evidence or theories of evidence that would allow for more and better charges, throwing out what was already done and having new and amazing evidence in hand with indictments ready to go and a brand new team that is not experienced in our crisis seems, it's terrifying. That's one of the things that we tried to meet with the Attorney General earlier this year and she didn't come because we don't want to start from scratch. We want to know what's going on. Also, there's a lot of vagary, there's a lot of words that are just botched, this and that. We want to know what you actually have and why and how that's going to lead to bigger and better charges. So keeping us involved as time goes, even if you can't give specifics, is a lot more helpful. And then also, um, just one of the things, please be clear that the $30 million price tag did, was not for the prosecution and that over $21 million was spent for the defendants. So please be clear, and to me, I'm sorry, but eight, nine million across three years to charge people is nothing, nothing for what we saw. If I can answer, eight, nine pe people to charge people and then walk away with nothing is a lot. Um, I, uh, I appreciate your concerns. Again, I can't speak for Attorney General Nessel. I know that she is extremely invested in this case. Uh, I want to tell you that I personally tried to reach out to you and talk to you, um, and I heard from your attorney. So, uh, but we'll continue to attempt. Okay. Well, we'll make sure that we have your contact information because I would like the opportunity to sit down and talk to you. Your attorney actually told me not to contact you. But if you are willing to talk to me, then that's fine. In fact, I would want, this is why we provided our number as well. We need to hear from everyone, especially everyone that has concerns or had questions. And there were some questions directed towards me and that's what I tried to answer and will continue to do so. In terms of our criminal experience, not collective criminal experience, we have, I think we tried to count it last time, <laughs> over a hundred years of experience. Uh, I am proud to have been a prosecutor from the day I had graduated law school to the day I became the Solicitor General of the State of Michigan under the direction of Kim Worthy and prosecuted. And when you're in Wayne County, often you are trying two cases, if not three cases at once, dealing with many criminal matters. And when I left there, I was the lead attorney of the Business Protection Unit, but mainly dealing with white collar crime. Um, I was asked a question, and now I remember what it was. I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Oh, I, I remember what it was now. You asked if I had ever had a case where we made plea deals to get uh, more responsible people. Of course we have. We don't do it that often, but of course we have. Of course. Yeah, but we would do it the proper way and do it proper. There's a procedure, a policy and procedure that must be followed. Ms. Sullivan. Laura. Um, two questions. Um, oh, oh, that's, and, and Keisha just pointed out something very important. We don't dismiss cases before they testify. We don't dismiss cases before they do what they say they're going to do in the proper. It's a very different circumstance. Uh, my, my first question is, I don't understand uh, 
I, can, I, can, I, can, I, I think I can understand why some uh, cases had to be dropped right away um, because of a pending ruling from the judge. But I don't understand dropping the case against Darnell Early and Howard Croft. And I think that, um, well, based on what I, what I do know, uh, they were really key figures in um, identifying or, or pointing to criminal acts done by the governor and by his agents. And so it worries me that their cases were dropped. I don't understand that. Okay. My second question is, uh, in the last hearing that I attended, um, there are representatives from the Attorney General's office um, sitting with the defendants at their table, the optics of which was a really kind of alarming. And that, that representative of the Attorney General's office, and I get in their sides, but that representative of the same office said that there was nothing to all of this information, all of this new, uh, newly recovered data. That frightened me. What frightened me even more in that hearing was to hear that the, 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 an investigator, a detective, who was part of, of um, inventorying that information was, was a detective that I've been working with uh, under Todd Flood. And, and so I, I, it's just really hard for me to see how two people from the Attorney General's office are, are saying opposite things about the value of, of, of evidence. And, and it's that evidence that is being used to discredit the previous prosecutor who, like many of us have said, we had to rely on him because he was the guy that we could see, the only guy that we could see, who was fighting for us every day. So I think those two questions are linked. I really believe they're linked. I really believe there's something about letting go Darnell Early and letting go of Todd Flood. If there's not, I need to understand that there's not. All right. Let me try to do a better job of explaining it to you. So you certainly deserve that. I can answer the question about, I can answer the question about the court. I can give that to Bob on answer. But we had to dismiss everything. Because when you get as much material as we have, as we were able to recover in the search warrants, over 600 physical documents, you know, the phones and the laptops, etc., and also all of the information that's contained on those documents, could be thousands and thousands and thousands of more pages of information. And then you have the almost 20 million documents that recovered. We don't know what's in them, and once we go through them, there may be even more information about any particular defendant that was dismissed. We do a more robust investigation and maybe we bring more charges. I don't know what we're gonna find, but it would be irresponsible to ignore all that evidence and then continue to go along with the charge cases. But in court, somebody from the Attorney General's office said that there was nothing there. I might have to let her answer that because I think she was there and I wasn't. But again, we had to dismiss everything. It was the only ethical, moral, correct thing to do when you have all of this other evidence that has not been discovered. So one, another point that you touched on in the first question, that doesn't mean that those people want, the charges can't be brought or they can't be interviewed. Um, and if any plea offers were to be given for testimony, it would have to go through the proper process. And we've had some real concerns with the process because recently, for example, we had to do the proper after somebody already took a plea, which was extremely concerning as prosecutors. And uh, it's, it's nothing like we've ever seen in that case. Second, uh, first, it wasn't me that was sitting next to the defendant, well, I know. I, right? Okay. Yes, clearly it was not. Clearly it was not. No, it was somebody else from um, the And to be honest with you, that was even before we knew what was out there. Uh, this is what was so interesting about that. Because this is a big accusation, right? There is a lot of evidence out there. And at that time, we didn't even exactly know how much until a motion was filed by the Attorney General's office, and I think we all reviewed it and said, they're saying they have 20 million documents. That's, that's how we ended up finding out. Filed by the civil side. Because remember, I know it, it, it looks like it's the same 
it is the same office, but we have very different roles. And as you can tell, we were on separate sides. They have their job and their clients to protect, and we have our clients to protect, and our clients being the people of the city of Flint. Right. But After that motion so was filed, is when we received those documents. And it's just common sense. When we executed the search warrants and used that motion as basis for our probable cause for our search warrant, that's when we ended up going to the Attorney General's office, even though it was my office, and we served a search warrant on them, and it validated what we had suspicions of, and we were able to receive all 20 million. Now, if 20 million documents were preserved and were collected as relevant to the Flint water crisis, if somebody else is okay with 1% of that, we're not okay with that. And I don't think you would be okay with that. No, I'm not, I'm not. And, and I think maybe I'm just missing something here. Was the person from the Attorney General's office who said there was nothing to this information, were they lying? Yes. No. Were they, were they no. That person did not say that. If you go back into the record, they said, we are not saying that this information is not relevant. What they were saying is they did their job and that it wasn't their fault that we didn't have that information. They didn't say that it wasn't relevant. They said that they complied because you have to remember. Now, if you really want to break it down, we'll break it down. Okay, let's break it down. So, the way this was done is that they said, listen, the prosecutor before agreed to this. Agreed to the way this was done. So then we started doing our research into who in the world would agree to something like this, okay? Then we started doing some of our own investigation. And this is what our investigation led to. There was an agreement uh, by the Office of Special Counsel in this case as to how uh, discovery uh, was to be produced. That agreement was signed by the former special counsel and was also signed by the attorney for former governor Rick Snyder. Okay? And that agreement, just to add, and it might not be relevant, but maybe it might be, was signed at the Detroit Athletics Club. So, if, if this is a, this case, this investigation was signed through an agreement as to how discovery is going, how the evidence in a case is going to be delivered by an attorney of a man who wasn't even charged. And if anybody thinks that that's okay, then that's their prerogative. And if anybody thinks that this, these agreements that there's nothing wrong with these agreements being signed at country clubs when you are talking about a marginalized community with 40% in poverty and that's not privilege. That did, that did raise a lot of concerns to us. And that, is how, that was what the agreement was. So yes, there were agreements. It was not the Attorney General's part in terms of them not providing everything. People have to seek evidence. Prosecutors have to seek evidence. We have to make sure we work our investigator to seek search warrant. The chief investigator of this case was Andy Arena. The chief investigator of this case would make the calls as to what is going to be investigated, what is going to be submitted, and whatnot. Some people can call the shots, and some people can't call the shots. And common sense should tell you a lot more. I'll tell you this, I am extremely proud that the person that drafted our search warrants and has complained about discovery or had concerns about discovery is Jeff Sapinko. And him and his team 
have done an exceptional job that we were able to recover in one month what was not recovered in three years. And for that, I commend every single one of them. And when you ask, when somebody asks why some people are not on the team, we will keep on dropping people that were in the position to make decisions that involved this crisis and drop the ball over and over again and we're still getting paid for it. Okay, and that's enough being real though. I've been advised we, we are over time, but we are going to take two more questions. Okay. Come on. Come on. Let me finish. Please keep in mind that the team has agreed to stay after to speak with you. No, we got to speak. Let us speak. Lindra Brown and Dorian Green. If they got to go, let them go. You need to let us speak. Lindra Brown. Please. Who do you work for? Come on, man. Who do you work for? Jones. You can't do this to us. You can't do this to us. All right. First thing I would like to say, I do appreciate y'all. 
But uh, if it wasn't for Eric Mays, a lot of these people wouldn't even be involved in this. He is more than an elected official. He's an activist. He's a street. If black must again, I will repeat myself. Most of these people in here were very cool with Eric Mays at the beginning of this crisis. A lot of the information that they have received from Eric Mays. A lot of these people that they came up here and talked to have talked to you because of knowledge received from Eric Mays. Right. I would deeply advise you to sit down Probably make them a part of y'all team. You know, maybe y'all could get some charges before your 90 days are up. My 99, I'm, I'm hoping it's 18 months because if it took them three years to go through 1.5 million documents, how y'all gonna do that in nine months? So, and another question, Paul. I just went through a court case where I was on the defense side. The prosecutor was finding evidence before we went to the courtroom. Charges wasn't dropped. Evidence was added. The prosecutor passed the evidence on to us. We set up our defense for it. We went to trial. I'm wondering why y'all have pressed charges and then just added. Good question. Thank you. Who's next? Who's next? Your question is why don't we add charges? Why don't we add charges? Just add charges as we find the evidence. That's just not a responsible way to do an investigation, sir. It really isn't. We we want to be able to do the whole investigation, so we don't have to go back. We want to look at all the evidence. How do you know what the charge against someone's going to be? As you they come up, you charge the them with their charge. How can you formulate a theory of the case if you haven't looked at all the evidence? Obstruction, charge. How are you going to know Murder. what to charge. charge if you haven't looked at all the evidence? Yeah, we, that's just not the way it's done. We investigate the first, and then we sit down with the charges. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee anything. What I'm going to say is we're going to, except for, except for, we're going to let the facts and evidence lead us. I can guarantee you that. So, so you know how to like to wrap up? So, I, I, like I said from the very beginning, we came here to listen. We came here to try to understand. I'm not even beginning to say that we can do it in a, in a two hour and 15 minute period of time. We want to find a way to continue this dialogue. We cannot um, discuss individual facts of the case. I know everybody gets that. But we want everybody to contact us through this number and we will make sure to review anything that you have to say. Uh, we are going to be talking to some of you. Some of you we've already talked to. We plan to talk to more. But what we can guarantee, as I said a minute ago, is a full and fair investigation that, we're, that nobody is off, off limits. Whatever the facts tell us to do, we're going to do. Whatever the evidence tells us going to do, we're going to do. And we're going to get it done within the period of time that we have. And I just want to make clear, even though we are looking on the short side of things, the nine months, we all, there are other possible charges that could be out there after we do the evidence that gives us a long period of time. We are going to look at the desks, we're going to look at everything that we can look at, and we're going to pay very, very close attention to what we have so we can issue the proper charges. Of that, I can guarantee. Hi, Julian, on behalf of our team uh, and the Attorney General's Office. One, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for asking your questions. And quite frankly, I know that a lot of this wasn't easy, but we believe that you deserve transparency and we hopefully what we can do is keep doing what we've been doing is to make sure that we do a thorough investigation in this case and we go through what should have really been gone through a while ago. 
Uh, this team is a dedicated team, and um, hopefully we, this is a learning process. I know that some of you had concerns. We're gonna take those concerns with us, and we look forward to keeping those lines of communications open. So thank you. Go ahead. Please, okay, sir. Have a I think it's important for the city of Flint to sat here. Come, come up in the microphone, ma'am. I think it's really important for the city of Flint to know, for you to know, that we've sat with our issues for five years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We need to see you have a very good attitude when you come to Flint to embrace us, to give us all the time we need. We feel that when you talk about money that's been spent, that's our money. We feel that this new administration, we don't know the difference yet between our and D, the Democrats, because we haven't seen it. The question is, how can we trust you when you look at the clock and say you want to leave, when I came up midway and said we didn't know to sign up at the door, we want our elected officials to speak. When you come to Flint, we want to make up the rules. We don't want you to decide because you're on a higher level in your thinking. In your thinking, we want respect. How do we trust you? So. The two-hour time limit was actually determined by the hall, which I believe was determined yesterday at that meeting as well. There is a time. Let me finish talking. Let's check our attitudes. Let's, let, let me finish talking. Because don't, don't scream over people. Just your house. We just want to have a conversation, okay? We, okay, I understand that. Let, 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 me, let me finish talking, please. We are restricted by the time at the hall as they were yesterday. You know, ma'am, because you've been in those meetings with Attorney General Nessel, when she didn't bring cameras, she didn't bring press, she sat in there with activists, correct? So the effort has been made. The effort has been made. This is not going to be the last conversation, but we are on a time restriction. We have no say on the time of the hall, okay? There, the, would you like me to ask the members of the hall if we can have more time? No, because there are, the, this is, no the conversations are over. If you want to come to the front and speak with the members of the team who, are, who want to speak to you, you are more than welcome to do so. No. There is going to be a semi-truck of water in the back that was brought from an activist out of Houston, Texas, who flew in today for this if you want to get water for those people who are here. And again, we will be having the, they will be speaking to people if you want to come up. So you're talking over me, which is what you don't want us to do. This ended, okay?